Welcome, everybody. Um, I want to just jump right in because we have so much interesting material today to talk about in our panel on animal aesthetics and how gender and aesthetics are not limited to the human world. Uh, my two colleagues that are here to present today, I'm, by the way, I'm Ani Patel. I'm a fellow here at the Radcliffe Institute this year, and I'm a professor of uh, psychology at Tufts University. Um, anyway, so my colleagues here are my colleague from Tufts, Zarin Machanda, an assistant professor of Tufts uh, at the Department of Anthropology and Biology, and longtime uh, uh, research director of the long-term research project on chimpanzees, the Kibale Ch uh, Chimpanzee Project. Zarin has spent the past 17 years studying wild chimpanzees in Uganda, and uh, is especially committed to their conservation. Her research revolves around social relationships in chimpanzees and wild chimpanzees. Uh, Machanda has also conducted several studies in chimpanzee communication that have helped shape our understanding of human language. Um, she's also on the board of directors of this really great project called the Kalial? Kasisi. Kasisi Project, an organization that works with more than 10,000 school children in Uganda, implementing conservation and education programs. Um, and the other colleague here is Professor Richard Prum, Professor of Ornithology at Yale and Curator of Ornithology at the uh, Peabody Museum of Natural History there. He's researched many topics in biology, including feather development and evolution, sexual selection, and the dinosaur origins of birds. Uh, he's the author of a book called The Evolution of Beauty, How Darwin's Forgotten Theory of Mate Choice Shapes the Animal World and Us. Uh, that was published in 2017, which was included in the New York Times 10 Best Books of 2017 and a finalist for the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. I read it last winter and I highly recommend it to you all. Uh, he's been uh, awarded many fellowships, including the Guggenheim and the MacArthur and the Fulbright, and um, he has directed Yale's Frank Program for Science and Humanities, so he's used to crossing these boundaries that we so much like to cross here at Radcliffe. So just the briefest of uh, introductions into a concept that will be important today. Many of you will be familiar with Darwin's theory of natural selection, his uh, great idea about uh, the mechanism of evolution, of how species change over time, uh, which involves some key things like there has to be variation in traits, let's say like how long your bill is if you're a bird. Um, some of that variation has to be inherited uh, by the next generation, and that variation has to be related to differential survival uh, and reproductive success. So for example, a longer bill might help you find more food and therefore survive better and pass on your genes to the next generation. Um, so that has to do with how you survive in the environment, finding food, escaping predators, and so on. But there's a second mechanism that he proposed in his great book, The Descent of Man, about human evolution. Actually, a lot of that book was spent on talking about animals and um, his other principle of evolution called sexual selection, which is also variation in traits, which is inherited, um, which leads to differential reproductive success. But this time, it's about traits that help you compete for mates things that may be a display that helps attract a mate, or something that helps you fight off a, com a competitor in the battle for finding a mate. So these two ideas, natural selection and sexual selection, are different mechanisms of evolution. And today, we're going to hear about how they play out in terms of animal aesthetics. So with that, I will invite uh, Richard to give our first presentation. Great. Thank you to Ani, and thanks to the Radcliffe Institute for this uh, marvelous opportunity. When the uh, invitation uh, came to address uh, beyond words, gender, and the aesthetics of communication, it was like a dream come true. Uh, that means I have way too many aspirations for my 15 minutes. Uh, but, uh, so what is an ornithologist doing here? Uh, I have been working on the evolution of courtship display and uh, the physics and chemistry of, of, of color of feathers, uh, uh, avian display, and it through evolving through sexual selection for a long time. And that has led me to uh, 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 some, uh, uh, some uh, really revelatory things about, um, about the agency in the, in the, in, in the world. So what I, what I want to do is give away my, uh, my punchline. Uh, I, I think that there, we can scientifically establish that birds are beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves, that they are agents in their own evolution, that, that subjective experiences actually are uh, the core of what sexual communication is about. Um, in, in addition, having uh, uh, understood or, or, or recognized the agency, aesthetic agency in, 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 in birds, that leads us to understand for the first time what it means when agency is infringed by sexual conflict or sexual violence. And that leads to the conclusion that uh, sexual autonomy matters to animals. 
that there is something it is like to have freedom of choice and that the capacity to reinforce your freedom of choice or to earn and create sexual autonomy evolves in, in the wild and that this uh, has real implications for how we think and understand our own, our own evolution. So uh, I have spent a lot of time looking at uh, what I call beauty studies, uh, the deep aspects of, of, of the courtship of birds. And I could go on about the physics of this blue and the chemistry of that purple, but I'm just going to uh, shamelessly use animal video uh, to... Uh, <laughs> this is an image, uh, a video of a, uh, of a male superb uh, bird of paradise in New Guinea. It was filmed by my student, Ed Scholes, uh, a number of years ago. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is a, a, a lecking species. The female does all the reproduction and chooses among available males. What we're going to see here is an incredible performance of an, a, an amazingly transformative <laughs> communication event. The, the, the female is regarding this male at inches away. And those, that blue is a, is a photonic structure, a structural color. And around that blue is our super black feathers the physics of which we've just uh, described in the last year. Now, interestingly, this raises a lot of questions, and I want to just go straight into the controversy in evolutionary biology, which is that most of my colleagues believe that sexual selection operates to select for characters that actually provide objective information about quality. And there's the alternative is that this is purely aesthetic, that it's about subjective uh, pleasure uh, in the act of choice. So in the science of, that I recommend, the subjective experience of animals should be moved to the center of our science, not explained away as merely a path toward adaptation, but as, as, a, as a right in itself. And here we have the, uh, imagine the olfactory world of the mole, or the, or the sonar world of the bat, or the electrical world of the more mirrored fish, which sing songs in electrical pulses that vary in tempo and frequency, like music, but in an entirely different wave, right? Well, of course, I study the birds down here, which you can much more easily relate to, right, uh, in sound fit. But I want to propose that there is a, uh, that's a little loud, pardon me. There is a, a mode of evolution that I'll call aesthetic evolution, that is an emergent consequence of sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice. And then what this choice, either sexual or social or ecological choice, happens on a heritable substrate, you get the evolution of aesthetic features that function not in the physical world, but in the cognitive domain, in the evaluation, the, the aesthetic evaluation of conspecifics or other organisms. And this applies to both sexual signals, but also to flowers and to the sense of flowers. So part of this research is to try to bring beauty back into the sciences as a legitimate uh, topic of the science. And so uh, uh, what I, uh, uh, do, to define beauty in a way that I think is scientifically productive, I say that beauty is not merely attraction. Beauty is a co-evolved attraction in which the form of preference or desire is shaped uh, uh, to, to match uh, the, the, the object of, 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 of desire and that these shape, this shaping has happened through a mutual entrainment of interactions. I won't spend time on how to differentiate between the adaptive and non-adaptive view, but I express my view as beauty happens. And what that means is that when there is choice uh, on a heritable substrate, that beauty will arise. That's an expectation of nature. And that mate choice in this regard is kind of like a spinning top. It creates normativity, but that normativity is unstable over time. And that if you spin the top millions of times, it will go to different places. And that is why nature looks the way it does. Now, uh, I, I haven't been able to defend any of those uh, assertions, but I'm going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what this does is focus the science on the aesthetic agency of animals, the fact that animal choices uh, are really at the heart of the science. Now, uh, for uh, accidental reasons, really, uh, uh, um, I moved from this area in sexual selection to start working on duck sex. Now, duck sex is a problematic topic. <laughs> uh, and when Patricia Brennan, now at Mount Holyoke, came to, my, came to my lab with an interest in working on the evolution of avian genitalia, I thought, well, I've never worked on that end of the bird before. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. Uh, but what I learned transformed, really, my understanding of biology in a fundamental way. Now, duck sex is problematic because there are, well, mo much of duck sex is what we imagine. Females, like this female mallard, choosing males on the basis of their co-evolved 
uh, preferences for traits, like the green head and the quack, 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 right? But in ducks, there's a problem that high breeding density also leads to many males not being uh, paired, and leading to forced copulation, or essentially rape in the ducks. And what that is made possible as a, as a consequence of the fact that birds have a penis. That the penis evolved in the common ancestor of reptiles and mammals, but was lost in, uh, in uh, most birds, but still retained in, uh, in, in, in ducks. Uh, so this is a, 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 a fascinating and also troubling, because this animal, for example, the penis of birds or ducks is very unusual. This is the largest penis for any animal of its body size. It's actually longer than the duck. Uh, so it took Patty Brennan, a female biologist, to come to my lab and say, what is with that? Where is that and how is that functioning? <laughs> so uh, a bit of introduction to the, to the avian penis. It's, it is homologous, but very weird. It's, it has a counterclockwise spiral. Uh, it has an open groove instead of a closed urethra called the sulcus. Uh, and it comes uh, in, uh, in smooth, ribbed, and toothy varieties. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and most of which have co-evolved with forced uh, copulation or with, uh, with uh, force. Now, in science, we aim to change lives. And the next video will change your life if you've never seen a slow-mo video of a duck penis e erecting. Uh, but, uh, uh, that, and so here, here we have it. Uh, if you don't want to have change your life, then keep your eyes closed. <laughs> this is a video taken, and the erection of the penis takes a third of a second. It unfurls from outside in, uh, and, and that is a, uh, a, 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 well, you can see 16 uh, centimeters there. And I want to point out that we're using the metric side of the ruler, so that means that this is actually science. Okay? <laughs> now, Although, although ducks are common barnyard animals, it took until 2010 to actually describe something that all farmers or all people around waterfowl have known, right? So uh, this is a, a, a new and unknown biology. So what's going on? Well, what, we, what Patty discovered uh, is that uh, there is a co-evolution between uh, the penis and the vaginal morphology in ducks. And on the left, we have a small penis and a simple uh, vaginal tract in a species that has very little forced copulation. But on the right, we have a species with a, a, a advanced or frequent forced copulations uh, with a convoluted and complex vaginal tract. Well, those, uh, that complexity matters. Here we see that females have evolved anatomical countermeasures against forced fertilization. On the inside of the vaginal tract, the first set of things are a set of blind pouches or dead-end cul-de-sacs. And above that is a clockwise spiral. So female ducks have literally evolved an anti-screw device <laughs> in their anatomy, right, which they can behaviorally deploy during forced copulation. And we know this is effective because in species where 40% of the copulations are forced, only 2 to 5% of the eggs in the nest are fathered by males other than the social partner. So this is a 98% successful birth control method, right? That is FDA approvable, right? <laughs> so how do the ducks do it? How do they evolve such a thing? Uh, we were able to actually demonstrate that vaginal or demonstrate that the, the shape of the tract affects the success of intromission by having ducks erect their penises into these glass tubes. Uh, male-like on the right and female-like on the left. And they failed over 80% of the time to completely intromit or to enter the female or the, to enter the glass tube uh, 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 that was shaped like a female. What this means is that sexual autonomy matters to animals, right? That, uh, as I said, there's something that it's like to have freedom of choice and there's something that it's like to be, have that infringed. So how could these structures evolve? Well, when the, ma when the female chooses the male that she prefers, her offspring will inherit the traits that she and other females have evolved to prefer through the, the, the aesthetic co-evolution. But if she's forcibly fertilized, then her offspring will more likely inherit either a random trait or a trait that she's specifically rejected, which means that they're less likely to be recognized by other female ducks as attractive. That is the indirect genetic cost of sexual violence to females. And so anything the female can do behaviorally or anatomically to reinforce her freedom of choice will be rewarded by other females. 
So these anatomical structures grow as a consequence of the power of aesthetic normativity. Females who agree on what is attractive can use that to advance their freedom of choice in the face of persistent sexual violence. Right? Now, that is a kind of statement that as a scientist, I never thought that I would uh, be in a position to make. And I think it is a scientific statement uh, that is, um, uh, we've led to specifically because of recognizing the aesthetic agency of the aesthetic position, right? Richard. Now, uh, duck sex is uh, a coevolutionary arms race played out in the genitalia, but there are other uh, kinds of birds that, that, that show other sorts of uh, responses. Here is a bowerbird. The bowerbird uh, is a, a male, builds this structure, which is not a nest, but a seduction theater, right? And it has one seat, and that one seat <laughs> is occupied by the female. Okay, so I think I got 240, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, what we see here is the female is, um, uh, or this is a male, and uh, the bower have uh, various kinds of architecture. So here we see, for example, a male with his ornaments, and in the front of the ornaments, those ornaments are actually fossil clamshells. So this is a paleontological <laughs> bowerbird. <laughs> As a curator, I kind of relate to this guy. <laughs> but, so that's actually the male, but he's sitting in the position where the female sits. So when the female sits there, the male is out front displaying to her. But now we see the male makes the bower because the females prefer it. They are the agents that, 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 that have shaped the architecture. But now we see the other feature, which is that when the male uh, uh, approaches the female to copulate, he has to go back around the walls of the, bow of the bower, providing her with the opportunity to pop out the front if she doesn't like the way things are going. So the bower is aesthetic. It has architecture. But it also has this extra feature that it protects her from sexual coercion. right? And, and so she can intimately regard the male at this intimate distance for as long as she likes. Right? and to make her coherent choices and have that freedom without, without threat. Right? And I call this aesthetic remodeling. Mate choice has remodeled maleness in a way that furthers female sexual autonomy. So then lastly, what do females do with their freedom? They choose beauty. And so freedom, autonomy in nature creates an explosion, aesthetic explosion in the bowerbirds with elaboration of all kinds of architecture and all kinds of ornamental structure, right? So that is the second profound uh, um, discovery that I never thought I'd be in a position to make, that's, that has been made possible uh, by the aesthetic, right? This sort of phenomena is going on not just in sexuality, but in other choices, like ecological choices, like pollinators and frugivory or uh, coral snakes, which are kind of a genre of horror in the <laughs> natural world, right? Uh, another kind of art. Uh, and so uh, I see my time is up. And I, uh, if you like this, uh, there's more. <laughs> and uh, please check out Evolution of Beauty. Thank you very much for your time. And time. Penises are a very tough act to follow. <laughs> I will do my best. Um, I will say, just as I'm starting, that I was teaching a class and once needed a, a picture of a duck corkscrew penis and made the mistake of Googling corkscrew penis in Google. Don't, don't do it. I forgot the duck part. It's a, it was really terrible. OK, so I'm here to tell you about chimpanzee communication. Um, it's something that I have studied for many years. And I'm particularly interested in sex differences in chimpanzee behavior and how they manifest in kind of communication. And I would be remiss today if I didn't all teach you how to find your inner chimp a little bit. So chimpanzees give at least 60 distinct vocalizations that we generally have a good idea of what each of those mean, not, not every single one. And if you spend time with chimps in captivity or the wild, one of the most commonly heard sounds that you will experience is the pant hoot. Now, this is the, pretty much the loudest call that a chimpanzee could give. We can hear it in the forest for up to two to three miles. So imagine being able to make a sound that you could hear, that someone could hear you three miles away. So, the call actually has four different components. And let me actually just say, 
This is, in many ways, a way that chimpanzees give a greeting. It's kind of a hello, I'm over here, I'm really excited to see you. It's a call they give when they're socially excited. Um, before two groups of chimps meet up, they often call, give this vocalization as a way to say, hey, come over to me, I'm really excited. So that's why I think this is appropriate for this venue. So the call comes in kind of four parts. The first is called the pant, so it's Oh, 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 oh. And then they're excited, so it gets louder and faster, and it's called the buildup. Oh, 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 oh. And then they have the hoot, and the hoot is the loud part. So this is the part we hear from very far away. And the other thing I love about the hoot is that it's very individually distinctive. So when I hear hoots of different chimps, I can usually tell who is hooting just based on that sound. So the hoot, as you're thinking about your inner chimp, the hoot could be something like, it's going to be loud. <laughs> the hoot could be something like, ah! Okay? Something like that. <laughs> it could be a little bit more melodious. It could be like, ah! 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 Okay, so think about, think about you as a chimp. And then, this is very important if you're going to teach small children this call, you have to stop screaming eventually. Okay? <laughs> so at some point you stop screaming and you kind of relax and you have this let down. <gasps> okay, so let's put it all together. This is my pant hoot. hoots to say hello back to me. So, are you ready? Yeah. Remember, this is loud. So, how many times have professors told you to be as loud as possible? <laughs> Never. They should hear us in Porter Square. Okay? <laughs> you ready? <gasps> 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 Wonderful. Now, here's an actual chimp giving a pant hoot. This is a chimp named Johnny. So I, I could tell you that's Johnny. Johnny's hoot is like, woo, woo, it's amazing. Okay, so there is a lot of information encoded in that one vocalization. So through many studies by many different people, we know that um, the pant hoots are mostly given by males, so the ma males give this call much more, much more often than females. Males who are high ranking tend to give this call more often, so alpha males pant hoot more. Interestingly, we also know that individuals who have higher levels of testosterone give more pant hoots, and the actual hoot has a higher pitch when their testosterone is higher. But there's also a lot of social information encoded by this uh, call. We know individuals who are good friends with each other tend to pant hoot together more often, so they chorus. And when you see chimps in the wild pant hooting, a lot of times those first parts that, oh, oh, they'll actually extend that so that they wait for other individuals to join in. And what's interesting is that not only do these calls kind of, kind of indicate or give us a sense of who who, which chimps have strong bonds, but they also facilitate more cooperation with the chimps. So if they chorus together, you're more likely to see other cooperative behaviors between those individuals. And interestingly, they also give us information about group membership. So different groups of chimpanzees have different dialects of pant hoots. And my fa one of my favorite studies is that a group of Dutch chimps got moved to Scotland, and the Dutch chimps actually learned the Scottish dialect <laughs> of the chimps that they now had to be roommates with. So there is a lot of meaning in these vocalizations. But one of the things that we often have trouble with is trying to figure out what these calls mean and really trying to understand different aspects about these calls. And we can take a lot of data in the wild just observing things, but another way that animal scientists have collected data on the meaning of calls is through the use of experiments in the field. And uh, so I'm gonna tell you about one that I love that we did about uh, nine, six years ago now, 
where we were trying to understand the vocalizations that chimpanzees give in response to things that scare them, like snakes. So we found a python skin, we stuffed it to make it look real, and then we hid it on a path, and we covered it with leaves so they couldn't see it. This is, the, this is obviously the illustration of this. And then when a chimp came by, we would reveal the snake to them, and we would then record what happened. So here is what happens. This is a chimp named Nambi. She's about to get exposed to the snake. Nambi seeing the snake. Booing. 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 So that voice is the co my colleague, Anna Marika Shell, who collected the data for this. So that first response, oh, oh. Very kind of, it's probably what we would do if we saw a snake. <laughs> now here's the interesting part. Now this is a view from behind. That's Nambi, and this is Nambi's son. So she's just hooed, and you're gonna see her look back. And she's giving this call called a wah bark. Whoa, whoa, whoa. She looks back, she sees who her, who's behind her. Here is the most amazing thing about this study. We, had to, we did 40 trials, different chimps, different groups. When chimpanzees saw the snake, that who, that who, who, that seemed to be just automatic, a reflex, a, a kind of a fear response. But that wah bark, that who, who, what they would do is they would look behind them, they'd see who, there, who it was behind them, and if it was a friend or a relative, they would wah bark, and if it was anybody else, they would keep walking. <laughs> So, what does this mean? Two profound implications of this. One, chimpanzees are jerks. <laughs> we know that. But I think more interestingly, from a scientific point of view, chimpanzees, at least in this particular call, are showing signs of intentionality. Signs that they can control the sounds that they make and give them in different contexts. And they don't have, they can choose not to communicate. So I think that's a really important aspect, and that's something that really puts chimpanzees in kind of the sphere of humans, right? One of the hallmarks of human language is our intentionality in speaking. But chimpanzees also do a number of other types of communication. Obviously, we focus on vocalizations because we can hear them. But as you get to know chimpanzees more, you'll see lots of different kinds of communication. So here are two of our male chimps just sitting around grooming, this is something that we think they do to relieve stress. We know that chimpanzees, we know that males are much more likely to groom each other than females. So in a two-year study we did, we had 2,000 grooming events between males and, I'll just wait for the hornbills to pass, and 32 between females, so a huge difference. We also know that grooming just facilitates a lot of other cooperative behavior. So this is a way of saying, I like you, I'm not gonna beat you up, let's, do, let's have fun together. We also can do things about looking at the initiation of these kinds of events. This is Stout, this is Kakama, and you'll see they scratch each other, they're scratching. We think that may be a signal to, hey, I want someone to groom me, look how itchy I am. <laughs> and then they start grooming. This is a particularly fascinating behavior where when they groom, sometimes they just hold their hands up above their head. We have no idea why. We've done. We've done studies on this. We still don't know why they're doing this. And not every chimpanzee group does it. So this is something that we think is really cultural. Some groups hold hands, others don't. Lots of un unanswered questions in chimpanzee communication. Is this a signal? It's a debate. Why do this kind of grooming? Chimpanzees, especially males, often have communication just by, by trying to be big and strong. So when we watch male chimpanzees, um, we'll sometimes see them like lift all of their hair up. It's called piloerection. Of course, we think this is to make them bigger than they actually are. We have this vestigial response when we get goosebumps. It's kind of just a stimulus. We're, we're kind of stimulated, and that's what's happening here. Now, chimpanzee males are in especially interested in kind of being bigger than they are. 
and rank and hierarchy matter a lot for males. So this is Kakama, the same chimp that you see here. He's gonna walk by a lower ranking chimp and you'll kind of see his swagger, his bravado, and he really intimidates the little chimp. And that, that vocalization called a pant grunt is a, I know I'm not as dominant as you, please don't beat me up. Okay, and I think you could hopefully see that swagger that Kakama has. Now when chimpanzee males, when you're watching them, you'll often see them displaying. So it's not just that kind of everyday swagger, but a lot of times during the day, they'll actually puff up all of their hair and just run around and throw things and just act a little crazy, but act strong and powerful. So that was Makoku. Working in the jungle is a little crazy, so there's a lot of foliage in the way. There are four chimps displaying, and this is something we see on a daily basis, males making themselves look big and scary and intimidating. Now, this is a product of sexual selection, but unlike the birds of paradise where we, you know, where we see the evolution of ornaments, what we're seeing here is more of the evolution of armaments, things that are good for fighting abilities. And what happens in chimpanzees is that males are competing with each other to have access to females. So we th see things like males are bigger in body, body size, they have bigger canine teeth, they have bigger bodies, more muscles. But interestingly, we also see that they're more social, just like we saw those two males grooming. And that's because what happens with male chimpanzees is that a lot of times the way they get to the top is through their friends. So a, an alpha male often gets to the top by having friends. So that kind of sociality is very important for those males. Females are much more kind of concerned with raising their offspring. Once a female chimp becomes an adult and has a baby, she nurses them till they're four or five and then has another one. And over her lifetime, she probably has about five or six. And so the daily lives of female adult chimps are m very much about mothering. And I will say just to um, highlight I don't have anything about chimp penises, but they are actually extraordinary as well. <laughs> um, the fun fact to take home with you today is that male chimpanzees not only compete with their bodies, but they compete with their sperm. So male chimpanzee, a female chimpanzee will mate with every male in the community when she's ovulating. And so there's I, people's faces. OK. <laughs> so, um, so chimpanzee sperm has evolved to compete with each other, to be very fast. And they have to make a lot of sperm. And so chimpanzee testicles, chimpanzee testicles are giant. They hang down to their knees. And um, the, the size of a, one chimpanzee testicle is the same size as their brain. And they have two testicles, OK? So they're in your almost out of time. Yes, I know. OK, so just, I just want to kind of echo something that Richard said, which is when we see females, I want to just focus on females for maybe one minute. Um, when we see females, they often do approach males for copulation. I'll show a quick video. And here you're going to see Tongo approaching Kakama. Kakama has his erection. And you, this is Tongo. This is Kakama. And you'll see her approach him eventually. He's scratching. He's drawing attention to himself. <laughs> This is why we can get so much more intimate detail on chimps than humans. And she goes up to him. They copulate. The average copulation is seven seconds, so don't be too impressed. <laughs> and I think one of the questions that we can discuss with Richard is this idea of female choice. I think a lot of you might think that K Tongo is choosing Kakama as a mate. When actually, a lot of our studies show that what's happening here is a form of conditioning coercion. And male chimps are so aggressive to females on a daily basis that when it is time to copulate, the females approach the males more out of a fear of retaliation than as a choice. And so in fact, what we see are probably aspects of male choice. Males have preferences for older females, mate with them, aggress against them more often. 
And as I'm getting off, I do want to just say we tend to focus on male communication, but female communication is interesting, it's more subtle. And as I'm walking away, I'll show you a little video of a mom and her baby. And this is a mom who's trying to sleep and a baby who's sitting on her face. <laughs> So thank you very much. I'm sorry I went over. Thank you very much, both of you. So to launch in, um, I wanted to start uh, just quickly, Richard, with your, this idea of aesthetic remodeling. And if you could just quickly remind us what that idea is and how you think it might apply to human evolution. Ah, so. Um, Aesthetic remodeling is uh, a way in which female choice uh, can evolve to, uh, to change maleness in a way that furthers uh, their, their, their freedom of choice. And, and, and so it's, uh, it means that preferences are correlated with something else. Uh, they're correlated with actually more females being able in the future to have uh, more choices. And, and, uh, um, in the book, I have the opportunity to, 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 to apply both uh, arbitrary female choice, or beauty happens, uh, and sexual autonomy evolution to human beings. And, and, and uh, I have proposed, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's probably about as grandiose a theory as you can get, though it's a bit, a bit, a bit embarrassing, but in fact, uh, I propose that uh, one of the biggest uh, ways to overcome the kind of uh, um, environment of coercion that, that we see in chimpanzees uh, is through female choice, uh, taking coercion apart bit by bit. So I propose that the, uh, the, the, the reduction of canine weapons in males, uh, male uh, uh, humans, uh, or male primates have weapons in their faces that human males lack. And it's an important question to ask, how do you get males to give up their weapons? That's actually a quite potent question in America today. Uh, but uh, the, answer, the answer in, in, in evolutionary sense is you make them unsexy. And, and I think that's been uh, one of the roles. And also the reduction of uh, size dimorphism. We're a lot bigger than chimpanzees. That would mean that we predicted to get very much different in body size, mm -hmm. and yet we're much more similar. Uh, it turns out the, the famously peaceful bonobos are actually a lot more different in body size than, than humans are. Hmm. Interesting. And I think one of the other aspects, just instead of just thinking about canines, is that I don't know if you noticed, but Tongo, when she was ovulating, chimpanzees have this very visual uh, pink signal, which is a swelling of the labial tissue, which is about 10 days around ovulation. It's a, hey, I'm ovulating, I'm ready to mate. And obviously one of the things that humans have lost in the course of our evolution is this sexual swelling. I'm very happy about that. Um, <laughs> but it does mean that what humans have is concealed ovulation. And I think that has allowed human females to um, change the interactions that they have with males in, in ways that chimpanzee females can't do. Mm. Exactly. Zarin, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, we talked, to, you talked a lot about the binaries between male and mm -hmm. female chimps, but what about um, one of the themes of this conference is, you know, the continuum? Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing you mentioned to me is that there are different ways of being an alpha chimp. It's not always yeah. about being the tough guy, right? And could you talk a little bit about the, the continuum kind of? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that was, that's lacking sometimes when we talk about animals is the variation that we see within a sex. Um, and so for being an alpha male, we have examples from my study site where we have kind of Kakama, who was just a jerk just a despotic male, all, you could tell all the other chimps just were like, he'd show up and they'd be like, because oh, he was going to beat everyone up. And in contrast, we had Big Brown, who's actually still alive, um, and he was the politician, kissing, he still plays with babies. And he really had success by being friendly with everyone, um, conceding matings when he needed to, building relationships, um, and I would say they were in many ways equally successful. Yeah, that's so yeah, I think you, you can have different forms. That is fascinating. Uh, this looks like it's running down to zero, which means we're about to go to audience questions, right? OK, so we'd like to now open it up to members of the audience. There should be a mic appearing pretty soon. And, and then please do line up and make sure your question is a question. And then we'll try and honor everybody who comes to the microphone. So uh, my question is, if uh, female birds are selecting for the beautiful male birds, how come in the history of fashion, although in world histor historical terms, m human males have been at least as fashionable and colorful as females, if not more so, 
for the past 250 years, it's switched completely to the other side. Can you offer me a scientist's hypothesis about why it's uh, females of Homo sapiens that now are the colorful ones? Um, I, I would say that the scientific answer is patriarchy. Um, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I actually, one of the conclusions of the book is that science, patriarchy is uh, 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 the appropriate scientific way to describe that, that, that situation. I, I will ta also talk just a little bit about birds. I focused on female choice in birds because those are the aesthetically most extreme birds on the planet and that happens to be where I, where I, I started with my own field work. Um, however, there's a huge variety of that in birds. Uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, um, uh, mutual mate choice. You think about puffins and penguins, where males and females have identical ornaments and identical preferences and, 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 and long-term pair bonds. Uh, and then there's polyandrous species, where a female will acquire a territory and defend it with weapons and large body size and attract multiple males. She lays the eggs, the males take care of the nests uh, and, and eggs uh, entirely on their own. So there's lots of other kinds of variation within birds uh, as well. And I would also say that with human fashion, whether it's male or female, I think we possibly can also interpret that as a way of uh, displaying status, yeah. right? So not just beauty, but also our status. Thank you. Lucia. Um, so my name is Lucia Jacobs, um, and I would like to tie the, the morning's talks to these talks, which is the, the, um, the role of olfaction and, and, and the sense of smell. In fact, in bird, um, there's new, new studies showing birds are actually using odor to choose mates and zebra finches. And, um, and what I think it's, um, you know, of course, and mate choice, odor and mate choice is kind of universal in insects and, and vertebrates. And, um, and what's interesting is, it, tying into your bowerbird example, is that in mice, um, there's this complex signal that females are using to decide whether or not to approach a male. And there's a long distance olfactory signal. And then there's a contact olfactory signal. And the long distance ones is very similar to what you said about the bower, where the female can make a decision from a safe distance. And I think the whole question of male aggression, which we know is, is important for many animals, um, females always have that problem. Like, who is it? How good is he? Um, uh, and, and, but, but, um, and, and is he going to hurt me? And, and I think that there might be a very interesting parallel um, in, in, in mice that um, I would hmm. like to hear what you mean. Well, uh, olfaction is uh, is probably the least studied sensory modality in birds. The 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 the, the idea is that they don't have a very good sense of smell, uh, but there are lots of exceptions that are being known. Uh, uh, for example, uh, parakeet auklets, which live in the Aleutian Islands, smell exactly like tangerine. It's, it's not actually just like tangerine. It is tangerine. It's the exact molecule that makes tangerines smell like tangerines. And they, uh, but however, they uh, rub each other all over with it. Uh, they call it the riff, the, 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 the sniff rough, where they're uh, <laughs> rubbing each other with tangerine oil. Uh, and so they're using it at a very intimate distance. Uh, and, and, but we don't really know much about uh, 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 pheromones or olfactory communication in, 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 in the lives of birds. Thank you. Let's, let's move on to the next question. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I have a question for Zarn about the uh, transferring of cultures between the chimpanzees. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about how those cultures are observed and then how you observe them being transferred. So is there a dominant male in one group who decides, well, we're going to use the Scottish call or the Dutch call, or is it the transference exactly like that they were already there in the Dutch? It's, it's probably a combination of a lot of things. I would say, in many ways, the transfer of culture among chimpanzee communities is gonna be driven by females because females are the ones that transfer to new communities at adolescence. So they're the ones that bring things from the culture they're born into into a new place. And one of the interesting things we saw about that hand clasp study um, is that they actually clasp hands in different ways. So they can go you know, palm to palm, all sorts of different ways. And the way they do it is the way their mother did it. Hmm. So a lot of times there's a lot of female influence, I think, in chimpanzee culture. But I think you're right, though, that with some vocalizations, we see dominant individuals kind of being the ones who everyone else copies. Thank you. We have two minutes and two questions. So let's Hi, let's um, Professor Machanda. I was curious, um, first of all, whether uh, 
female chimpanzees are exempted from sex when they're raising their children, first of all, no. Um, and then secondly, I was curious about the snake uh, example that you gave and whether it was entirely binary, the results, because I would have assumed that uh, you would actually see greater evidence of evidentiality or intentionality if one or two of the chimps had actually indicated to strangers as opposed to just one or the other, if you saw kind of a, a range of results. Sure, there, there's always a range. I mean, so the result, you know, there were certainly chimps that would give calls to, to not, there, none of them were strangers. It was either are they related or, or good friends. So there were certainly chimps that would call to, to, pe to people, chimps that weren't good, good friends, um, but the major, you know, it's, it was kind of a majority. We did not see a difference between males and females, so that's also kind of interesting. And just about your sex comment, um, female chimps don't generally have swellings while they're lactating. Um, sometimes they do, and female chimps, when they have a little infant, tend to separate themselves from the group, so we don't really see that many interactions. So they, in many ways, protect themselves and their offspring from some of that. Thank you. Thank you. Can we do one last quick question? Hmm? Oh, she, oh, great. Okay, well, we're done. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you.